Part A asks us to find the time at which the particle momentarily stops moving. We can't find this out from the position function alone, because the position function only tells us where the particle is at a given point in time. If we want to find out when it stops moving, we would want to find out when the particle's speed is equal to zero. Now since velocity is defined as the derivative of position, we can just take the derivative of this function to find the function for velocity, and then set that equal to zero. Let's first find that derivative. The derivative of 4.0, well, it's a constant, so the derivative is just zero, and we can basically ignore that bit. And the derivative of negative 6 times t squared is something we'll have to use the power rule on. So we can take this exponent here and multiply it by the coefficient on the outside to get negative 12t. And the exponent, the squared part, just disappears as per the power rule. So this is our function for velocity. The velocity is equal to negative 12t. And we want to find out when this is equal to zero. Well, it's pretty obvious that the only time when negative 12t is equal to zero is going to be when t is equal to zero. So this is the time at which the particle momentarily stops, when the time is equal to zero seconds. Part b asks us to find the position at which the particle momentarily stops. Well, now that we have the time at which this happens, we can simply take t equals zero and plug that into our position function to find out where the particle is at that point in time. So for x of zero seconds, and I just remembered that I almost forgot to include a unit there, though some would argue that you don't have to include units for a magnitude of zero. I personally disagree with that. Anyway, so for x of zero, we just plug zero into t and we quite simply find that x at that point is going to be equal to 4.0 meters. So that is the position at the point when the particle momentarily stops moving. Part C and D ask us to find the times at which the particle passes through the origin, hinting that one answer will be negative and one answer will be positive. Now in this case, the word origin is just being used to refer to the t-axis, which is where the particle will be when x is equal to zero. So let's take our position function here and set it equal to zero. This is our equation now, and we want to algebraically solve for t. It's a pretty easy equation to solve, but I've shown out the steps here anyway, just in case you want to follow along. So we find that time is equal to the square root of 4 over 6, and since square roots can technically be either positive or negative, I've included a plus or minus sign here. If you put this into your calculator to get a, a more easy-to-read numerical answer, we can see that t is going to be equal to plus or minus 0.82 seconds. For part e, we're asked to sketch a graph of the position function. Now you could probably try to do this in your head, but for the sake of precision, I'm just going to show a graph that was generated by a graphing calculator. And here is a simple graph of the position function. Uh, this actually has an interval of negative 3 seconds to positive 3 seconds, as opposed to the negative 5 seconds to positive 5 seconds range that the problem asks for. But it really shouldn't make that much of a difference, and hopefully you get the idea. For part f, we're asked to shift the graph rightwards by either adding a plus 20t term or a minus 20t term. Once again, you kind of just want to experiment with a graphing calculator here. And you will see that in order to get the graph to shift to the right words like this, you will want to add a plus 20t term to the function. Finally, part g asks us whether we're increasing or decreasing the value of x at which the particle stops moving when we generate this second graph here. Now if you look at the graphs side by side, you'll see that when we add the plus 20t term to the second graph, not only does the graph seem to shift to the right, but it also seems to shift upwards. Notice that the peak here seems to be higher up than it was in the, the first graph we created. Since that peak of this graph represents where the slope is zero, in other words, where the velocity is momentarily zero, in other words, where the particle momentarily stops moving, that is all represented by this peak. So since that peak has seemed to shift upwards, that means that the value of x for where the particle stops moving has now increased.